The Merchant Marine in the Second World War was supposed to just tool around the world's oceans, delivering supplies to ports and troops in Europe, Africa, and the Pacific, while the real fighting was done by sailors, soldiers, and marines. But due to German U-boats and other attackers, the mariners actually operated in an extremely dangerous niche. One of the biggest dangers was of U-boat attack, when even a single boat could wipe out an entire convoy provided that the boat was able to surface and attack using its deck gun. The mariners were in danger from the moment they lost view of the land. U-boats would typically attack deep into the Atlantic, but they liked to remind Americans that they weren't safe at any time, so some U-boats were sent to hunt right off the coast. Regardless of when the attack came, most merchant vessels didn't have any kind of sonar or radar. Not even all Navy vessels had those detection systems in the Second World War. So unless your ship was in a large convoy with a naval escort, you wouldn't know where U-boat was until it attacked. When the U-boat attack got underway, it played out in one of two ways. If there were no threats of a U-boat in the area, you would find out that you were under attack when a black hulk slowly surfaced in the nearby waves, where a few sailors would pour out of it and the deck gun would begin firing on your ship. These were often capable of sending 3.5 inch rounds into the hull of your thin skinned cargo vessel, allowing water to pour into the lower decks and slowly send you deep into the sea. And since the attacking vessel is a tiny U-boat and not an enemy destroyer or cruiser, there's no way to get rescued. You have to paddle your lifeboats through a sea filling with oil from the sinking ship, potentially as it's on fire. Being attacked by the U-boat's deck gun was actually the preferred method. That's because the other likely method of attack from a U-boat comes via its torpedo tubes, which means there's no surfacing ship, no scramble of sailors to warn you. You might, might notice a darkness in the water before a stream of bubbles starts racing towards your ship. If you look a few feet ahead of this stream of bubbles, you'll see the 21 inch diameter, almost 24 foot long metal tube barreling towards your ship at nearly 35 miles an hour. And it will reach you. It will hit you. Its 600 pound or heavier warhead will rip apart the hole. What happens next depends almost entirely on what cargo is being carried. Got a bunch of foodstuffs like grain and fruit? The boat will sink fairly slowly and you'll have a chance to escape. But if you are carrying lots of heavy war material like tanks and planes or worse industrial goods like iron and coal, you're pretty much screwed. The weight and density will take the ship down in only minutes. But the worst came when the ship was carrying fuel or oil. The massive explosion from the torpedo warhead would often rupture any tanks on the targeted vessel, providing a massive burst of heat as the pressure wave mixed the targeted fuel with the outside air, virtually guaranteeing massive fireballs and explosions as the torpedo exploded. When you're on a tanker and the tanks suddenly explode, there's not a lot that can be done. The steel around you has likely been twisted, the decks are burning hot and searing your flesh, and the blast wave has likely scrambled your brain. If you're lucky enough to survive, you now have to overcome your scrambled brains, make it through the burning corridors, and then try to get in a boat and get away from the deck before the suction takes you under. If you did make it out of a shipping ship, your deal isn't over. Traditionally, combat ships would rescue survivors from enemy vessels once hostilities were over. If a cruiser sinks a destroyer, then once the destroyer crew surrenders, the cruiser crew would begin taking on the survivors and would later take them to POW camps. But U-boats barely have enough room for their crews. They can't take on survivors. So, after sinking anything from a fishing trawler to a destroyer to a passenger ship, the U-boat crew typically can't do much more than offer some loaves of bread or water before sailing away. They wouldn't even tell other allied ships where to pick up their survivors, at least not at first, since that would give away the location of the subs. At the start of the war, U-boats would actually stop and pick up most of the people that they sank. That would all change though on September 17th, the day after the bombing of U-156, which in the case of U-156, they were helping to take survivors ashore when they came under aerial bombardment by U.S. Navy airplanes. This would cause Admiral Donitz to send a message to all U-boat commanders, which would become known as the Laconia Order, forbidding any attempt to help survivors of sunken ships. While it might not have been a great order to be given, 
I can honestly not blame the Germans after the scenario that happened. Even if your ship was in a convoy, there was no guarantee that you could be picked up by friendly ships since a U-boat wolf pack could sink the entire convoy, leaving dozens of lifeboats in its wake, filled with slowly dying soldiers desperate for water or food. To add insult to injury, merchant marine members were rarely paid for any period where they weren't actively crewing a ship, and no, lifeboats don't count. So their harrowing trial to survive at sea is performed for free, solely for the hope that they'll survive. And throughout all of this, the U.S. would often keep the sinkings of its ships secret, reporting just a couple of ship losses every week while dozens might have gone down. Luckily for mariners, British innovation and American industry eventually gave the sub-hunters the edge over the submarines, culminating in Black May 1943 when German losses got so steep that subs essentially withdrew from the Atlantic, allowing the merchant marine to finally sail largely in peace. Thanks for watching. Remember to like the video and subscribe for more content.